Amen. I said, Amen. Amen. You rise up on your feet. We're going to pray together. You can sit down. Sit down, please. Now make up your mind. If you really want to rise up, stand up. We're going to pray. Close your eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you at this time because of this meeting we have, this conference we have. Lord, we pray you touch and toss around, even at this time in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, our coming here will make a definite mark in every life. And you'll put something within us, inject us something from heaven. That, Lord, will never remain the same again in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, you will make us people who are sensitive to your word and sensible in your presence so that, Lord, everything you want to do, you will do with every one of us. Bless us and make us channels of blessing. Make us disciples indeed that will be able to do what you have a portion for us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We're sitting down now. And we're concentrating on the word of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 4. Verses 18 through to 22. Matthew chapter 4 verse 18. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee. Saw two brethren Simon called Peter. And Andrew his brother. Casting a net into the sea. And they were fishers. That's the best thing that ever, that ever happened to these fishermen. This wasn't their first time of going to the seaside. They have been at that seaside for a long time. And if Jesus had not showed up, their lives would have remained the same. And would have forgotten about them long ago. How many other people fished? Or were fishermen in this same sea, at this same shore? We've never heard about them. The day Christ comes to you is the beginning of something to be remembered for the rest of your life and for all eternity. Jesus came to them. What a great privilege the population of that of the world at that time was about 250 million. And out of those 250 million, Jesus said, Who should I touch? Where should I go? Who should I invite? Who should hear this voice coming from heaven? He decided he'll go to the seaside. There were better people than Peter and Andrew. There were better people than James and John. The members of the Sanhedrin were there. The political parties were there. The zealots were there. And Jesus said, who will I go to? And then he decided he saw these people. He saw them before they saw him. He got there before he got there. He had a vision of them before they viewed him. He saw them. He saw their heart. He saw their past. He saw their present. He saw their future. By the way, he first came to Peter. That's Matthew chapter 4. And you'll discover as you read Matthew chapter 10, the least of the disciples, what came first? Peter. You go to Luke, who came first? Peter. You go to Acts, who came first? Peter. The people he first went to, and then Andrew, and then James and John. Look at all the list of those apostles and disciples. Those four always led the team. Anywhere you see the list of those apostles and disciples, you always have Simon and James and John and Andrew. The order may change as you go from chapter to chapter. But the first person is always the first person, Peter, Simon, Peter. What a great privilege when Christ comes to you. What a great privilege in all the bustles and the hustles of life. And Jesus decides, where will I go today of the teeming population of this country, of the teeming population of this world? He decides to come to you. And then he passed by. 
which is the best place to go. You think about the city. The synagogue is there. The temple is there. The streets are there. The palaces are there. And the seashore is there. And Jesus decided it will be at the seashore that he will meet the people. Do you think this is the best environment you can see? Tom, maybe not. But Jesus decides this is the place to come and meet you. And then in verse 19, he says unto them. There wasn't even a long message. There wasn't any kind of motivation. There wasn't any kind of pleading. He just said unto them. Follow me. You followed your mind until this time. You followed a carved out vision, a personal ambition until this time. You followed a profession, a trade until this time. You followed a religion until this time. Now, follow me. Those two powerful words. And so hear the words of Jesus from heaven. And he says, follow me. And then he said on that condition, I will make you fishers. They were fishermen already. But he said, I'll make you fishers of men. This whole world, like a sea of humanity. And there are many people, like the fish lost in the depths of the sea. And I've come to call you. Come and assist me and join hands with me. I'll make you fishers of men. I'm not sure Peter realized. I'm not sure you realize what was brought up in that word make. I will make you. It's like, you know, a teacher, a professor going to a little child. And he says, come on. Come to my class. I will make you a medical doctor. That little child will not understand. It's just a little child. Maybe in primary one. And then this professor comes to their neighborhood and says, Come on, give me your hand. I will make you a medical doctor. Or he goes to another vicinity. And he says, Come on. He saw these children that are playing the f- in football in their community. And he says, Follow me. I'm a professor, I'm an engineer. I'm going to make you an engineer. Now you begin to understand it's a process. That that child then will leave the football. You have to leave something before you can follow somebody. And then they left everything and they followed him. Andrew, what did he tell you? I will make you. In that making, number one, there is a melting down. You know, before you come to Christ, you're just sure of yourself. You're very rigid. Your mind is rigid. Your neck is rigid. And Jesus says, I'll melt you down. I cannot make you in the position I find you now, but I'll melt you down. Number two, I'll mold you. It's in that molding that Jesus then takes your life. He looks at the perfect picture, what you ought to be. And he looks at the imperfect portrait where you are today. And from the imperfect portrait onto the perfect picture, he begins the process of of melting you down and then molding you. And then after that, he begins to also mend your life. After you are born again, have you discovered some things in your life? That the Lord said, now we're in the process of making. I'm going to mend some things in your life. We'll put this right, we'll put this right, we'll put that right. And then he says, I'll monitor you. You know we have to do that if you're a manufacturer. You have to keep on monitoring and measuring what you're doing. Without the measure and the monitoring, you don't know whether you're going to bring the perfect picture or not. And I'm going to mature you. I'm going to mature you. It's in that process. It melts you down. Then it molds you. And then when he sees anything that is not proper in your life, then he does some, he means you. He keeps on monitoring you until he now matures you. And he says, this is a model. He actually wanted to make them a model of the other disciples that will come after. But he said, there's one thing you are going to do before I can start. Can the teacher teach you before you come to class? 
can the can the professor begin the process of making you an engineer, a medical doctor before you come to class? No, you have to leave the playground and you have to come to class and then with a ready mind and with a sharp focus. You sit down there, you say, teacher, here I am, professor, here I am, begin the process of making me. That's what Jesus said. He said, follow me. And it is when you carry out that first assignment, then he says, I will make you fishers of men. Don't turn your eyes away from Christ. He's the one that is responsible for making you what you ought to be. And then he continues, it says in verse 20, and straightway they left their nets and followed him. You always have to leave something. And it's not always something that is simple and bad. You always have to leave something before you can follow Christ. And before you can follow the professor that wants to make you an engineer, a medical doctor, a lawyer, or whatever, you have to leave something back at home. And those things to leave at home are not necessarily evil. They're not necessarily bad. You have to leave even some friends, some time-wasting friends. You leave them behind. I'm going to school. I'm going to college. I'm going to university. I want to be made a fish of men. And so you find these people leaving everything and following the Lord. The question I'm asking you is, number one, have you left anything behind? Yes, I know if you're born again, you have left your sin. But more than that, have you left any other sin behind? Two, are you following Christ? Three, do you see his melting hand or do you reject his melting hand? Sometimes a message comes and God uses that message to melt you down, to crumble you down. And then he's trying to mold you into shape. And he's trying to mend your life. And he's trying to mature you into a model. And sometimes it's inconvenient. Have you allowed Jesus to start the process of making you, making you a son disciple? And straightway they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from this, he saw all the two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a sheep with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. When Jesus meets you, when he calls you, it's very important. Here we find James and John mending their nets. And as you look at James and John after this time, look at them in the church. They are mending relationships. Look at the epistles. They are mending the lives of those believers. They're not so much into even, even getting people converted. They're looking at the people that are converted already. And John, the apostle of love, is always mending them. The fellowship with the Father, that's what we're introducing to you, that you may have fellowship with us and fellowship with God. Mending. He made them mending their nets and then he said, come on. You can mend something more than a net. You can mend something more than an instrument for fishermen. You can mend something within the kingdom. Is God talking to you today to mend relationships? And to mend, you know, the lives of people. He wants to do it for them, but he wants to use you when he meets you. And then he says to these same people, he said unto them, follow me. And then what did they do in verse 22? And they immediately let, immediately let, time is precious. Immediately. If we say, maybe I'll decide tomorrow. You, you've lost 24 hours already. What you could do with Christ in 24 hours? If you say, I'll do it next week. You've lost a whole week already. Immediately. You see, some some people say decide today because who knows you may die today. Well, that's one part of the story. But who knows you might lose a great opportunity of doing something spectacular for the Lord if you delay immediately when the Lord calls you. 
He sets the time. And he knows what you are supposed to do. He has a great work for you to do. And something very essential, very important. And he says, I'm calling you now. Don't lose a minute. A minute is very, very precious in the work of the Lord. The opportunities you have. The privileges you have. And then it says over here, immediately in verse 22, they led the sheep and their father. That wasn't sin. Their father was not a sin. But they had to leave their father. You know, we have some attachments and some affection. And sometimes those affections will, will tie us down. And our father will not be able to go with us. Mommy will not be able to go with us. And in fact, if you're going to be a medical doctor, if you're going to go to the law school, you have to leave your father behind. Daddy will not follow you to class. Mommy will not follow you to class. Brothers and sisters, a siblings will not follow you to class. There's some things we have to leave behind. There's some people we have to leave behind. We just have to make up our mind. If you're now a man, if you're now a woman, if you're not matured, mature to go to school, mature to walk alone, mature to take a decision. They, they were matured enough to take a decision. They left their father behind. Are you mommy's daughter? Daddy's boy? You cannot take a decision without daddy, without mommy. You cannot leave anybody or anything behind. You're still a child. You're still a baby. But these were adult people. They said, daddy, bye-bye. The Lord is calling. Bye-bye. Something great is calling. And we're following on. And you will follow. The call of a true disciple. That's what disciple. That means a learner. A learner. Put that down. It's a learner. From being a learner, it's going to make them a light. From being a light, it's going to make them a leader. And this is just the beginning. He said, follow me. You'll be my disciple. You'll be a learner. And then, not too far from here, he said, you are the light of the world. He made them light. And not too far from now, he made them leaders. Feed my sheep. You begin by being a disciple. You end up by being an apostle. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, caution against theoretical discipleship. Caution against theoretical discipleship. Number two, condition of true discipleship. The condition of true discipleship. Number three, the character of trusted disciples. The character of trusted disciples. Let's come to number one. Caution against theoretical discipleship. If you're a science student, you know what we call theory. You know, sometimes you pick up a science book. And in the very first chapter, you know, the, the writer, the author wants to make you understand uh, this is untested ground, unproven ground. It says these are theories. And it says, in fact, this theory is not proven yet. There are some missing links before we can take a final decision. Yes, we've gone to the lab and we've done everything we ought to do, but this is still, this is still theory. Yeah, but you know something that surprises us in those books is that by the time you come to chapter 3 and chapter 4, it's building on that theory as if that was a fact. And I'm saying, Professor, wait a minute. You told me in chapter 1, this is just theory. And now in chapter 4, you're building on it and making some conclusions, some sweeping conclusions, as if this is a fact already. That's what those who teach evolution, that's what they do. The theory of evolution. It's not the fact of evolution. It's a theory. And then when they are told that this is a theory, and there are some missing links who are still trying to wrestle with. By the time they come to their pictures and everything, at the, almost at the end of the book, they are, they are telling us, now this is that. I say, but you told me in chapter 1, this is only theory. They are theoretical disciples. And the Lord is cautioning us. And he's telling us, don't take the theoretical people, theoretical disciples, as if they were true disciples. Let's look at them one by one in um, John chapter 2. John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. 
When they saw the miracles which he did, you would have said, those are real disciples. They saw his miracles and they believed. And then in verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He did not commit himself unto them. He did not rely on them. He did not lean on them. He did not commit anything into their hands. And needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Remember once again, a disciple is a learner. What kind of disciples are these? Number one, counterfeit learners. Counterfeit learners, not dependable, not trustworthy. You couldn't lean on them. They were counterfeit learners. And we're looking at chapter 6 of John. Chapter 6 of John, I'm reading from verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14 says... That's John chapter 6, 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did said, This is of a truth, the prophet that shall come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and make him and take him by force. And to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Can you think of Christ running away from a true disciple? Never. But he ran away from these people. They wanted to make him a king. And then Jesus ran away from them. And look at it now from verse 24. In verse 24, when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took sheep in and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves, and ye were filled. Labor not for that meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto life everlasting, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him as God the Father sealed. You see these people, they were not for real. They thought they were looking for Jesus. And you would have thought they were disciples. But Jesus said, there are theoretical disciples. And you cannot lean on them. You cannot depend on them. In chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 60. Verse 60 says, Many therefore of his disciples, many therefore of those learners, when they heard, when they had heard this, they said, this is an hard saying. Who can hear it? In verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Many of his disciples, of those learners, they went back. It's not as we thought. What he's saying is not what I expected. Is not giving us what we expected. He will give. Number two, covetous learners. Number one, you have the counterfeit learners. Number two, you have the covetous learners. Number three, you have the carnal learners. Just carnal. They were just looking for the things of this world. And then I come to chapter 8 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, we're reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 8, verse 21. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. One of his disciples said, Lord, I'm hearing you. Lord, I want to be a learner. Of course, I want to follow you. But me first, the Lord second. Me first, your will second. Me first, your demand on my life after. Let me go first, bury my father. The traditional things are more important than the spiritual things in his mind. You know, there are people like that. They claim to be Christians, but it's me first. My ambition first, my will first, our tradition 
first, our family religion first. Give me the first place and then Jesus can take any other place you want. That's no discipleship. And here we have this man, as he said that me first, let me go first and, you know, bury my father. Here is what Jesus said in verse 22. Matthew chapter 8 verse 22 But Jesus said unto him Follow me and let the dead Bury their dead Let the dead bury their dead You don't have to be a disciple Before the, you bury the dead You don't need grace before you bury the dead You don't need the spirit of God Before you bury the dead You don't need eternal life before you bury the dead There are many dead people There without God Without Christ, without eternal life Without the spirit of God And without the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives They can bury the dead Let them do that Don't do the work of the dead I'm calling you to life. Here is the prince of life calling you. Let the dead bury the dead. You come and preach the kingdom. We never hear anything about that man again. And we're looking at um, Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 16. Titus chapter 1 verse 16. They profess that they knew God, they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. They profess that they know God. These are the people that say, I'm a disciple to you, I'm a learner to you. Are you getting the point of these theoretical disciples? Number one, counterfeit learners. Number two, covetous learners. Number three, carnal learners. Number four, corrupt learners. I'm sure you've heard of Judas Iscariot. He thought he was one of them. And the rest of the people thought he was one of them. And when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, nobody could ever guess that Judas Iscariot was the man. A covetous learner. A corrupt learner. But, you know, it was not for real. One, counterfeit. Two, covetous. Three, carnal. Four, corrupt. Five, conceited learner. Conceited learner. They're full of themselves. And you have to empty yourself of what you are full of before the Lord will fill you. Conceited learners. Proud learners. Number six, contentious learners. They argue with the professor. Why did you come to school if you already knew it? They argue with Christ. Why did you come to church if you already knew the message? They argue with the preachers. Why did you come to the conference if you already knew everything? If you are Mr. Know It All, Miss Know It All, Mrs. Know It All, why did you come? Contentious learners. And then number seven, condemned castaway learners. The end up where Judas Iscariot ended up. Condemned learners. Cast away learners. I pray you will not be like that. Give me a good amen. amen. Hey, you know, as you read your Bible, you'll find these people. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 19 verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, of the, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. Finding certain disciples. Finding certain disciples. Think about this. These were disciples. That's what they said. That's what people called them. That's what he called themselves, finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He looked at their lives, and he couldn't find the fruit of the Spirit. And he began to wonder, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He looked at their lives. He was meeting them for the first time. And he said, We are disciples too. And he couldn't find the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. 
They were full of complaining and murmuring. And he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And then this, and they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. I see. I understand your problem now. We have never heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then are ye bapti- were ye baptized? And he said unto John's baptism. Can that be right? Unto John's baptism. We've been following John. I'm not sure you followed John properly. Number one, John was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And you've never heard of the Holy Ghost? And John had the Holy Ghost, the spirit of Elijah. He will move on in the power and the spirit of Elijah. And you have never heard of the Holy Ghost? And John's mother was filled with the Holy Ghost. And you have never heard of the Holy Ghost? And Zechariah, the father of John, was filled with the Holy Ghost. And disciples, in quotes, you have never heard of the Holy Ghost? And John said, I come here baptizing you with water. There is one coming after me. He will baptize you of the Holy Ghost and with fire. And you have never heard of the Holy Ghost? What kind of disciples are you? Were you paying attention? Here comes Jesus. He was baptized in River Jordan. And while he was coming out of the water, there was a voice of the Father from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Ghost, like a dove, rested on him. And you have never heard of the Holy Ghost? And John said, I never knew him. But he that sent me baptized, he said, On whom you see the Holy Ghost descending, he is the one. And you have never heard of the Holy Ghost? What kind of disciples are you? They were not paying attention. If you pay attention to John, you'll hear the Holy Ghost. You will see the Holy Ghost moving in his life. But these disciples said, we never heard. We never heard. Maybe you are always absent from class. That's why you never heard. Maybe you are there, but your mind is not there. That's why you've never heard. And then, but thank God, there's always a possibility of you having what you have missed. You'll have it today. And the power of God, the Holy Ghost will come in your life in Jesus' name. But you see, these were not disciples for real. That's the point I'm making. They call themselves disciples. Other people call them disciples. Beware of theoretical disciples. I go to point number two. The condition of true discipleship. Condition of true discipleship. We're looking at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 1. This, and at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus. Saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said, except ye be converted. Notice that discipleship demands conversion. We cannot just continue the way we have always been, Doing the things we have always done, dressing the way we have always dressed, drinking what we have always drunk, mixing with the crowd we have always mixed with, and then say we're disciples. There must be a conversion, there must be a change in um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. There's a refreshing. There is a renewal. If we're going to be real disciples, and then in verse 26, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Turning away every one of you from his iniquities. You see that there is a turning. There's a transformation. There is a change. There is a movement. Discipleship sets you in motion. You cannot remain static. 
Well, but you have always been standing there, staying there, no motion. You've been in darkness before, you're still in darkness. There's nothing that propels you and moves you and throws you out of that place into a new place. And then you say, you're a disciple. No. Discipleship sets you in motion to move away from where you have been to where you ought to be. And there is a past that is different totally from the present. In First Corinthians chapter 6, First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were, past tense, such were some of you, but ye are present tense washed. That's discipleship. You are dirty, but now you are clean. You are corrupt, but now you are upright. You are in darkness, but now you are in the light. There is this turning around. There is this change. That's what, that's what brings us to the understanding of discipleship. In John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 30. As I speak these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to so those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. If ye continue, it's something to start. It's another thing to continue. You know, there are some temporary disciples. They are not true disciples. They are temporary they're just there today. And tomorrow you cannot find them. When the going gets tall. When the storm comes on. When the fire starts burning. When the persecution descends on them. When the professors and the lecturer challenge them. And when they demand from them of something that a disciple of Christ should not go near. When the pressure comes, they don't know what to do. That they are temporarily today, tomorrow you cannot find them. Jesus said, if you continue in the pressure, in the storm, in the flame, in the flood, in the difficulties, in the challenges, if you continue in my word, and you are not seeking an easy way out, and you bear the cross of the disciples, it says, then are you my disciples indeed? As you put all this together, what do you find? Number one, convinced, convicted learners. Those are disciples. It starts with conviction. You hear the word of God and you say, I must make a change. I'm convinced. There must be a turning around. I'm convicted of what I've been, what I've done, where I've been. There is the convinced, convicted learner. Number two, the converted learner. You know, just being convinced is not enough. There are many people that are convinced that smoking is bad. Not that they have let smoking, but they're just convinced. The people that are convicted that immorality will bring HIV, they are just convicted, not that they have changed. Number one, convinced, convicted learners. Number two, converted learners. They have been converted. They are turned around. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. Number three, cleansed learners. Ye are washed, ye are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Cleansed learners. Number three, conquered, crucified learners. Self is crucified and conquered. Not my will. Thine be done. The stubbornness of the heart is crucified and conquered. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. Self will, stiff neckness. That is the stiff neck. I will always do what I've always done. I will say what I've always said. I will act the way I've always acted. 
that kind of self-will is broken for a true disciple. And there's a conquered learner. I am conquered. I cannot say what I used to say. I cannot go where I used to go. I cannot be rigid where I used to be rigid. I cannot act the way I used to act. If you are still rigid, stubborn, self-willed, stiff-necked, you are not a disciple of Christ. But he's inviting you, he's saying, come, I'll melt you down. When you are melted, there is this fire of the furnace that melts your will. And say, Lord, I surrender. Conquered, crucified learner. Number five, consecrated learner. Now I commit everything to you, Lord. You died for me. And with those judge that if one died for all, they were all dead. I'm dead to personal opinion. I'm dead to personal ambition. I am dead to the things I used to say. I must do this. And I'm committed, consecrated, devoted, surrendered unto you. Number six, consistent, constant learners. Lord, I don't know it all yet. Teach me more. Lead me on. Moreover, Jesus, let me learn. More, more of his will to discern. I want to know more of his will, more of his word, more of his wisdom. Constant learner, consistent learners. And you know, all these disciples of Jesus, every time Jesus was preaching, they were always there. They had it yesterday, they want to hear it again. Consistent learners. They learned it before, they want to learn it again. Jesus is saying the same thing he said in Matthew. Now he's saying it in Mark, they want to listen again. He's saying it in Luke, they want to listen again. Now he's saying it in John, they want to listen again. In now comes Revelation, he said it before, he's going to say it again. They want to listen again. Consistent, consistent, constant learners. Not the people that say, well, I've had enough. I'm saturated. My brain is tired. My mind is tired. I feel I cannot take any word anymore. Those are not disciples. Disciples are consistent, constant learners. They say, Lord, teach me more. Give me this bread of life evermore. Give me this bread. I want more of it. Those are the disciples. There's a desire, there's a passion in their heart. They want more and more and more. Number seven, Christ-like learners. Christ like uh, the, the reason why he calls you and wants to make you official of men is to reproduce himself in you. He that believeth in me, the works I do, he shall do, and greater works than this shall he do, because I go to the Father. He wants to reproduce himself in you. Number one, convinced, convicted learners. Number two, converted learners. Number three, cleansed learners. You are cleansed. The souls, dirty, or trances are no more there. Dirty language, no more there. Dirty behavior, no more there. Shameful behavior, no more there. Shameful association, no more there. Shameful interaction with lecturers, no more there. This is a cleansed disciple. Lady, can I see you in the office? <laughs> Sir, things are different now. The things we used to do. I even wanted to come to you to tell you those dirty things, we cannot do them again. Things are different now. I'm cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And because of that cleansing, no more dirty play. No more dirty interaction. Cleansed. Cleansed learners. Conquered learners. And you know when somebody is conquered, you know, uh, when, when soldiers go to the battlefield and they take one of the enemy soldiers and they conquer him by his look, by his posture. You can tell he's conquered. His will is conquered. It's not in a fighting posture anymore. It's, it's in a submissive posture. What's your posture? 
What's your demeanor? What's your attitude? What do we see of you? Is there something in you that is still standing up opposed to the word of God? Or are you the conquered, crucified learner? Consecrated? We have to beg you before you serve God. We have to plead with you before you do what you ought to do. What is the consecration? Consecrated learners, consistent, constant, always there, always abiding in the Lord. Christ like learners. I pray God will do it for you. I come to point number three the character of trusted disciples. The character of trusted disciples. And there are some people that call themselves disciples. You cannot trust them. If you lean on them, you're already signing your own disappointment paper. You cannot trust them. They give a lot of promises in prayer. During the conference, you cannot trust them. It appears they have skill, capability, ability. But you cannot trust them to use those skills for the expansion of the kingdom. You cannot trust them. They seem to have a kind of promising future. We'll do this for you. We'll do this for you. We're not just ordinary Christians. We're campus Christians. And we're people. We know this. We know that. And you know, when I go for you service, I'm going to do this and that. It's all empty air. Coming out of an empty stomach. You cannot trust them. But there are some people, they don't say much. They just go on their knees and they say, Lord, just one life. And this single life, I'm going to spend it to the glory of your name for the expansion of the kingdom. And God says, yes, I trust him. What are the characteristics of those people? How do you know them? And what do you really need to have so that you'll be a trusted disciple? The character, the characteristics of trusted disciples. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 1. Acts 16 verse 1, then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple, notice that, a certain disciple was there, named Timotheus, that's Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. His father was a Greek, but the mother was a Jewess. And that means that on the one side, he had a heritage of the Jews. On the other side, he had the tradition of the Gentiles, Greek. And now he became a disciple, a believer. He had believed. And here is what we learn about him, which was well reported of by the brethren. Well reported of by the brethren. Paul came to town. And then he saw this disciple. He had never met him before. And as, as Paul, the apostle, saw him, the man had been converted, born again already. And then Paul wanted to take him. He said, that's the man, that's the man you should take and develop. A man you should take and train. A man you should take and just, and just reproduce yourself in that man. It's a good man. Everybody reported well of him. A trusted disciple. Trusted disciple. Trusted disciple. How much can we trust you? How much can we trust you when you're on the campus? How much can we trust you? How much can we trust you when the exam is coming? And they're, and they're throwing all these papers around. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? How much can we trust you? How much can we trust you when the lecturer calls uh, for a night class? And then he says, well, it's going to be a tough exam. And uh, you people, you better shape up and you better sit up. And all these holy, holy ladies, you know, in this class, you better shape up. Because, uh, you know, to get certificate out of this place, hmm, 
Anyway, you, you already know. Because your adults say, we don't have to tell you everything, all the details. You know what to do. How much can we trust you? When you are going on holidays, and Mr. So-and-so is going to have a birthday party, where will your conviction stand? How much can we trust you? That you say you are a Christian, you are a disciple, you are a learner, a committed learner. And now, when what you have learned is going to be called in question and going to be put in the balances, how much can we trust you? When a friend, a good friend, a close friend, an intimate friend decides, you know, my friend, it's like I, you know, I thought I would, you know, be a Christian for the rest of my life, but it's like my mind is changing. I, I don't want to leave the church without telling you I'm leaving. I just want to tell you I'm fed up. I can, you know, sit down, stand up, bend down, pray, close your eyes, open your eyes, raise up your hand, put down your hand. It's too much for me. How much can we trust you at that time? When the people that were your friends, when they, when they're going, when they're going away and they say, I'm sorry, I cannot go on anymore. How much can we trust you? But Timothy was well recommended by all the people. They said, Paul, and we, we know you've been disappointed by people. You know, Demas is there, Alexander is there, and the other people are there. But this one, you can trust this one. And he proved himself trustworthy. I pray you'll prove yourself trustworthy. But you know, there was a test. There was a test. This man had been a believer. And Paul, the apostle, saw him and he said, they say you're a believer. Yes, I am. All right, now let's do something here. In chapter 16, verse 3. He would, Paul, have to go forth with him. What a test. You're a disciple? Yes. You'll go anywhere with Christ? Yes. You'll You'll do anything for Christ? Yes. All right. I want you to go along with me. Where will you be going? I don't know. The Spirit will lead me. What will happen to us there? I don't know what will happen. The other day they stoned me. The other day I had a shipwreck. And the other day I had some mob wanting to just tear me to pieces. But you'll follow me. And he followed. That's a trusted disciple. When you put your future in the hand of the Almighty God... Well, so I don't care what happens to Paul. He's my mentor. He's going to be my father in the Lord. And I'm going to follow along. Whatever happens. And, and they were told. And he took and circumcised him. He wasn't a little boy. The pain of circumcision. And at that time, uh, there were all these anesthetics. They, what they do in medical science, that you'll not feel the pain. All that was not there. And it says, uh, you know, the cause of discipleship, if you're going to follow me, I'm saying to the Jews and the Gentiles, and good enough, your mommy is a Jew, and then your daddy is a Gentile. When we go to the Gentiles, they don't worry about circumcision. But you know, Timothy, we're going to reach out to some Jews. And those people, if you are not circumcised they're not going to accept us will you go through the pain of circumcision as now a young man Paul I'll go through anything I just want to follow you that's a disciple I'll go through anything I'll endure any pain I'll endure any pressure that's a disciple you can trust him and then we're told in this same chapter 16 verse 3 and then it says, Because the Jews of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep, which were ordained of the apostles and elders which were Jerusalem. They didn't have a private message of their own. The message coming from the headquarters from Jerusalem, that's the only thing, and, and that's what they gave to the people. You know how we want to be independent? Educated people, university people, college graduates. We have some intelligence, we have some understanding. Can't we cough out our own doctrine? And can't we do some, you know, put some touch on it that will show that this is original. 
<laughs> or are you going to practice plagiarism in a Christian? You just take what is coming from Jerusalem and then just give it to all the people. That's plagiarism. That's, you know, it's like you want to write an essay, you want to write an article, and then you copy this and copy that. No, we're, we're beyond that. Paul, the apostle, and Timothy were not beyond that. Those who are trusted disciples, they just took what came from their quarters, Jerusalem, and then they gave to all the churches. I have been original, forget it. Forget it. If you're going to be trustworthy, there is no originality. Christ has given us the doctrine. He has given us the word. And that is what they all gave to the people. And then it says in verse 5, so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Let me look at this, uh, Timothy. Trusted disciple. You'll be a trusted disciple. Give me a good amen. amen. In Philippians chapter 2, trusted disciple, Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading to you there from verse 19. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 19. It says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus who sent him out just shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, that's of Timothy, that as a son, what the father, he has served with me in the gospel. You know him, I know him, everybody knows him. There's a trusted disciple. No originality, no changing of the doctrine. What we got from the headquarters, Jerusalem, were given to all the people. Now, this kind of disciple, what do you know about them? Number one, a changed learner. A changed learner. Learning ought to change us. If learning does not change us, then nothing has happened. It should change our mind. It should change our world view. It should change our concept. It should change our lifestyle. It should change our interest. It should change our ambition. It changed learner. That's a trusted disciple. You see the change that came on Timothy? He was not circumcised before. Now he's circumcised. He was living in Iconium, that just around that little place. Now he's changed and he's following Paul all about. He was a person who planned his own programs before, but Paul is now planning the program for him. And Paul is saying, There's a way to go, that's the way to go. And he's telling the Philippines, the Philippians, I'm going to send Timothy to you. I've not told him yet, but he cannot he cannot say no. Once I tell him he'll come to you. That man is a changed man. It changed agenda. It changed plan. It changed ambition. It changed plan. That's a changed learner. Number two, a childlike learner. A childlike learner. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of God. A childlike learner. Not somebody so difficult, so tough. So uncontrollable, so incorrigible, but a chant like Lana. I listened to, you know, a brother that preached uh, the first uh, message. I was talking about stubbornness, stubbornness. I said, we on the campus, stubborn, stubborn. I'm wondering, how can we be stubborn if we're disciples? Change, chant like. Number three, chosen. Chosen learners. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And before the Lord could choose them, you must have seen some qualities in them. Are you the kind of person that Christ will want to choose for an important work? When the delicate work is to be done in the kingdom, are you the kind of person that the Lord will want to choose? When an operation is going to be performed on the body of Christ, are you the kind of a servant? Some, uh, are you the kind of person that the Lord will want to choose for a delicate operation in the body? Chosen. A chosen learner. John was that kind of person. 
he could choose. And then Peter and John sent to Samaria. Those were the kinds of people. And Paul the apostle. That that kind of person that the Lord could choose is a chosen vessel. To bear my name, my glory unto the Gentiles. Are you the kind of person when God has a work to do that is special and delicate that he will choose you? A changed learner. A childlike learner. A chosen learner. A cherished learner. Cherished learner. The disciple whom Jesus loved. Leaning on the bosom of Christ. Cherished. Cherished. How does the Lord cherish you? And almost, you become almost indispensable in the kingdom. And the Lord is saying, I have many disciples, but that one, that one, must be my son all the time. He's cherished. Do you make yourself cherished in the kingdom? To the leadership in the campus? Or are the, are the leaders just tolerating you? Are they just saying, well, God, give us more patience to accommodate this kind of disciple? Give us more humility to accommodate this kind of disciple. Lord, we cannot throw them away. No father will throw away a difficult child, a stubborn child, but God give us grace. And Moses is almost saying, Lord, have I given back to these people? How is it like this? Lord, if you're going to deal with me like this, to lead this kind of people, get me out of this world. Moses did not cherish them, but you know, he cherished somebody that was Joshua. With all the heart aches and the belly aches that Moses had, Joshua was always by his side. And even though Elijah actually wanted to die, when Jezebel was running out time, and Elijah was saying, Oh Lord, I'm not better than any of my fathers, kill me. But he cherished somebody later that was Elisha, pouring water on his son. Are you like that? Cherished learner. That when you are there, the way you learn, and the way you're sinking and soaking the word of God, and the way you abandon yourself to the things of the Lord, you know, uh, the leader is saying, if everybody is like this, Lord, preaching will be easy, ministry will be easy. Number one, a changed learner. Number two, a childlike learner. Number three, a chosen learner. Number four, a cherished learner. Number five, a charitable learner. Charitable. You're full of charity. You're full of good works. You're full of love. And then, number six, Six, a chaste learner, chaste, modest, pure, uncontaminated, uncorrupted, chaste learners. Number seven, challenged, challenging learners. These are learners that challenge us. These are learners. When we see their lives, they make us to want to go on. And you say, Lord, give me more humility. The way I see this sister, Lord, I need more gentleness. If I can be as gentle as that sister, if I can be as committed as that brother, challenged, challenging learners. Does your life challenge anybody? Or is your life just like so, so light? Just kind of lukewarm, not here, not there, not up, not down, not fiery, but not too cold either. Just moderate. Are you challenging anybody? That's what the Lord is saying. And the Lord is saying, give me your hand. Follow me. And I will make you what you ought to be. And the time has come for you to look at all these possibilities and all these stages of discipleship and learners and to say, Lord, I'm giving myself to you afresh, start the walk again with me, and the Lord is going to make something beautiful out of your life. Would you rise up then and tell the Lord, oh Lord, here am I, here am I, here am I, Lord, do something new and do something fresh, so that my life will be the life of a real disciple. Don't be a theoretical disciple. Don't be a theoretical disciple. Only making profession, but no possession. Pretending to be, but not really there. Don't be a counterfeit learner, a counterfeit disciple. That the Lord says, I don't know him, I don't know her. Her name is not in my book of life. 
His name is not in my book of life. Don't be a covetous learner, a covetous disciple like, like Judas is carried. Always grudging the people that pour the ointment on Christ. Covetous disciples, carnal disciples. Carnal. 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 Worldly. Earthly. Corrupt. Corrupt. Corrupt language. Corrupt posture. Corrupt appearance. Appearances that will make you feel corrupt on the inside. Conceited, proud, haughty disciples. Contentious. Always in conflict. Condemned, cast away. Be real. Don't be a counterfeit. Convicted, converted. Cleansed, conquered. Crucified, consecrated. Consistent, constant. Christ-like. Asking yourself every time, what will Jesus do? What will Jesus do? Day by day, you want to be like Christ. Moment by moment, you want to be like Christ. And when you are confronted with any situation, any challenge, any temptation, any trial, you're asking, what would Jesus do? That's what I want to do. A Christ-like disciple. Let him fill your heart with his grace. Let him cleanse your heart with his blood. Let him turn you around and transform you. Let him make such a change in your life. That what you are today will be higher and better and deeper than what you were yesterday. So there's a new life, a new language, a new commitment, a new yieldedness, a new surrender unto the Lord. So you'll not just be like this insipid, lukewarm, tasteless kind of water that he wants to spew you out you want to commit yourself to the Lord Lord turn me around no more a theoretical disciple but a true disciple no more theoretical but true Let the grace be evident. The grace of God. Let godliness be evident. The godly life. Let it be evident in your life. That you know beyond any shadow of doubt. That you have handed over yourself, your life to the Lord. And the Lord has made the necessary change. And now you can say, I'm no more what I used to be. A changed disciple. I don't say what I used to say. A changed disciple. I don't dress, I don't look the way I used to dress, the way I used to look. It changed appearance. I don't mix with the crowd I used to go out with. 
a changed association. A mighty change. A miraculous change. A change coming through the master's hand. A change. A changed disciple. Changed heart. Changed attitude. Changed behavior. Changed character and conduct. Changed association and interaction. Changed ambition. Now you want to follow the Lord all through your life. A childlike learner, childlike disciple, soft, controllable, no more stubborn, no more self willed, gentle, humble. A chosen disciple that God can trust you so much and choose you to do what you will not choose others to do. Chosen. Like Paul the Apostle, a chosen vessel. Like Timothy, chosen beyond others, before others. Above others. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Have you found out what he chose you for? To be in the kingdom at such a time like this? Chosen. To be in the ministry at such a time as this? Chosen. A cherished disciple. Not somebody you are just tolerating. Are we just tolerating you? Are we just saying, leave him there? Maybe something will change in the future. Are you just being tolerated or are you cherished? A cherished disciple. Look at your heart. Listen to the voice of the spirit within. And I will tell you. Cherished. Charitable. Charitable. Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels? If I don't have charity... And become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Do I have a faith to move mountains? And I then give my body to be burnt. If I don't have charity, profits mean nothing. Do you understand all prophecy and all mysteries of the kingdom? If you don't have charity, you are nothing. Charitable disciple. Charitable. Loving. A new commandment I give unto you. That she love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that she are my disciples. If you have love one towards another. As Christ has loved you, charitable. A charitable disciple. Why don't you tell the Lord, he'll plant that charity, that love, the divine love in your heart. To love you with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. A charitable disciple. A chaste disciple, pure, innocent, righteous, holy. 
He chased disciple. The, Paul the Apostle said, I brought you to Christ as a chaste virgin. Chaste. Challenged, challenging disciple. Does Allah like challenge other people to want to go on, to move on, to serve the Lord better, to go higher, deeper, further, farther in the way of the Lord? Or are you a discouragement to those who want to run? Are you a discouragement to those who want to serve the Lord? Or are you a challenge to them? Does your life motivate other people to want to serve the Lord better? Challenged, challenging disciples. Make a covenant with the Lord today. A commitment to the Lord today. You'll be what He wants you to be. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this call to discipleship. I was thinking because of the clarity of your word today. We're praying, Lord, everything that needs to be done within us so will be the kind of disciple you are really raising up and molding and mending their lives to bring us to maturity. Do it for every one of us in Jesus' name. Lord, cleanse everyone. Wash everyone, purge everyone, purify everyone that every impurity and iniquity, every hindrance to true discipleship, you'll take away from our hearts in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray we'll never be the same again. That your life will be reflected in us and through us in Jesus' name. That will come to that point when people just see us, just listening to us, they want to follow you. We we'll pray, Lord, you upon your spirit now, upon your people, upon your children over here, so that, Lord, what you want to see in us and of us, you will see in everyone in Jesus' name. Strengthen your people that will march on without looking back. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered us. In Jesus' name we pray.